What if I told you that in the wonderful land of Japan, they have daily drivers over there that are the size of our damn toasters? Well, I'd be lying, obviously, because no car is the size of a toaster, that would be impossible. But they do have some incredibly tiny cars out there, and just like everything cool, we never got them in the Americas, so most people don't even know they exist. Hi everybody, my name is Mark Roden, and this is the deep dive on the Japanese K car. Following the end of the Second World War, Japan was in some massive debt, and sadly, it was so bad that the normal citizens were starting to struggle too. So, in order to make some cashola, a couple car companies came up with an amazing idea. People were so broke that they weren't buying normal cars anymore, and instead, were going for motorcycles now. But as we all know, you can't really drive a motorcycle year-round comfortably, so that's when they decided in order to save the car industry, some car companies would make K cars. At first, they were marketed as something for small business owners to use as like a delivery vehicle, like take the Suzuki Suzu Light, for example. It's a cute little car that was used by tons of small businesses year-round. I mean, just first of all, imagine this thing delivering your pizza. That would just be hilarious. But shortly after, a company by the name of Subaru would release the first ever mass-produced K car available, and they called it the Subaru 360 No Scope, baby! Since these cars are so gosh darn small, they also had their own set of rules in order to fall within the K car class. At first, they were limited to only being available with a 360cc engine, which roughly translates to only 0.4 liters, by the way. For reference, most motorcycles nowadays have a much larger engine than that, so that's hilarious. And since the engine was so small, but the vehicle was much heavier than a motorcycle, they were incredibly slow. The Subaru 360 only had a top speed of 25 miles per hour, which might seem a little bit ridiculous, but once again, the rules stated that the cars couldn't even go faster than 25 miles per hour anyways. So at the end of the day, they were just doing what they were told. In the mid 1960s, however, the speed limit was increased to 37.3 miles per hour. And with this and the added success of the Subaru 360, other car makers really started to catch on to this wonderful new idea and we started to see some K cars with some interesting little bonuses on it. In 1968, Honda would release the N360, which would become the first ever K car with an automatic transmission. And then, two short years later, in 1970, the first ever K sports car would be released, also by Honda, and it was called the ZGS. Obviously, this thing was still not fast, but it had disc brakes on it which in the 1970s was not a very common thing even on some full-size sports cars this was insane news for the k car world they were no longer just cars used for delivering goods or little pack mules for the average folk to get to work and back on time now they were starting to have personalities behind them and the japanese people just kept on buying them in 1970 a huge k car company would be the first to break the speed limit and they called it the daihatsu fellow max ss with a blistering mind-boggling top speed of 39 miles per hour but then the unthinkable would happen the japanese government made way more restrictions for k cars and in return sales would start to drop harder than freaking college girls when they hear drop it like it's hot and this forced two huge names within the k car business to drop out mazda and honda with the sudden drop of mazda and honda japan realized they of a mistake and so they started to allow 550 cc engines now instead of the much smaller 360 cc engines because all these car companies were like bro we can't be selling no cars if the damn emissions is impossible to reach with the engine size so the japanese allowed it to happen at the same time they also increased the top speed these cars could reach to exactly 50 miles per hour which was just good news for the brands who wanted to bring some sports car designs to the k world on top of that companies soon realized they would be smart to start selling their k car vans to the general public instead of just the business owners and the first to do so would be suzuki with the suzuki alto a very iconic K car. This little van is something people still talk about today and is something that truly saved the car world. The K car world, my bad. And for good reason. Giving normal people the option to buy a van instead of a car meant they would have to pay less taxes, they got even more space, and they were less strict on emission standards, so sales finally started to rise again, going back to its peak of 700,000 sales in one single year. 
Companies also started to realize that they had more freedom now to add things that commuter cars had in order to sweeten the deal. So they did. In the 1980s, most K cars would be offered with air conditioning finally. Some were even given a turbocharger and some were given all wheel drive now. The most important model to utilize the new benefits would once again be Suzuki with their Alto van. They gave the Suzuki Alto a turbocharger and it was now all wheel drive with a couple vents on it and more aggressive aero to let people know that even though this is a K car, it could be fun to drive too, buddy. These added bonuses push the car up to the speed limit of 50 miles per hour, which yes, I know still isn't that fast, but it was literally the best they could do and they called this monster the Alto Works because boy oh boy, did they give it the works? <laughs> you get me? <laughs> and then it just kind of kept getting better. In 1990, during an economic bubble in Japan, the higher ups were obviously happy with how the economy was going. People could afford new things now and really didn't have much of a need for a K car anymore. But K cars had already sold so many models that Japan knew they needed to keep them alive somehow. So they allowed the manufacturers to bring the engine size up to a nice 660cc motor while also allowing it to have a very nice top speed of 87 miles per hour. Sure, this wasn't huge in any way, but for a K car, it sure was. The horsepower was sadly capped at only 64 horsepower, and this was due to a gentleman's agreement between the Japanese government, basically saying they didn't want a horsepower race between the K cars. Uh, they also did this with full-size cars around the same time, which is the reason why you see some of the 90s JDM cars, like the Supra and R34 GTR, claiming that they only make 276 horsepower when they actually made a little bit more. Same thing happened with the K cars. The 660cc era of K cars brought some of the most desirable models of K cars to ever exist and really cemented them in history as something worth talking about even with this new gentleman's agreement. We had cars like the freaking Daihatsu Copen, the Suzuki Cappuccino, the Suzuki Alto Works, got a whole new generation. The Mazda, AutoZam, AZ1, and many more were all produced during this era and were some of the most desired models within the K car world. The freaking AutoZam had gold wing doors on it and a turbocharged three cylinder making the maximum number of horsepower at 64 horsepower which sure the horsepower is not that great but when you think about how this car weighs only 1600 pounds you can very easily start to see the appeal behind owning one of these cars it's kind of like a miata they aren't fast in a straight line but you take it to like an autocross event you will have more fun than the guy in the freaking lamborghini yet trust me Due to all these new K car sports cars coming out and just how the economy was doing in general, K car sales absolutely soared in Japan. And at one point, they reached a staggering 1.5 million sales in one year alone, which would make up one third of the total automobile sales in Japan. These cars were literally starting to be everywhere and everybody wanted one or needed one, I should say. Just like almost every cool car from Japan in the 90s though, us in America never got K cars. We had some cars that were similar to K cars, the most notable being the Smart 42 or the Scion XB, but we never were actually given a full on K car because Japanese manufacturers knew there would not be a market for these out, for those cars out here, which let's be honest, they were right. Both the Scion XB and the Smart 42 did not sell well at all within the United States, but due to this very small demand of a huge market of cars, it was only a matter of time before us Americans heard about these cool little rockets from Japan and started to want them. So now, K cars are imported all the time over here, and so, since most of them are even larger than a freaking motorcycle, we can avoid taxes and emissions tests with these K cars. It's amazing. I mean, for example, there's a whole K car dealership in my town, and my town is not large at all, so that says something. In the year 2014, however, the K car craze started to die. Just like the rest of the automotive world, people got boring and they didn't want these sports cars anymore. On top of that, Japan had raised the taxes of owning a K car by 50% while also highly raising the gas tax for them as well. Because of this and the fact that electric cars were all the buzz now, all the K car companies switched over to electric vehicles and we haven't really seen a K sports car since then. There are still some pretty interesting models like the Honda N1 and the Mazda Carol in my opinion, but once again, they aren't special in any way. I just personally think they look nice. This sucks, change it. So 
The K car market started as something to make business owners' lives sim simpler without realizing they would start a whole new class of commuter cars in the years to come. And during the golden age of Japan in the 1990s, they made some of the cutest little sports cars for a fraction of the price of the big, the big boys like the GTRs and Supras. It's safe to say that K cars will never truly return to those roots unless another horsepower war happens in Japan, which I don't see happening. And even though it is very sad, sometimes I think it's best to let the legends rest in peace. That is the end of this video, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed another deep dive on more cars. This time it's just the whole thing of K cars. I wanted to do the whole, like I wanted to do K cars. I wanted to do like Suzuki Cappuccino, Mazda Autozam, but I didn't want to make a whole video dedicated to them. Maybe in the future I will, I don't know, but I just wanted to get the K cars out there so that you guys know what K cars even are because K cars are cool, man. I wish that we had some more K cars here in the States because I would love to just freaking like, there's this cute little car. They're like little toasters, man. They just drive around like, like look at them, look at them. You know what I mean? It's freaking hilarious. I love K cars. I want one. I'm probably gonna buy one one day, hopefully. Thank you guys so much for watching. I appreciate it. Let me know what other deep dive you want to see. And Das Badania, have a nice night.